Good evening. I think everyone's in here. I don't think we're waiting on anybody else. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Psalm 25. This is where we'll be tonight. Psalm 25. There's this book that I've been told I need to read, so it's on my list. Um, but it's a book I'm going to mention tonight anyway, as though I have read it, <laughs> because there's a good quote from it that I tend to use, which is actually on my phone right here, so I'm going to grab that while you're turning, turning there. It's a book called Practicing the Presence of God. It's written by a French monk from like the 1600s who uh, worked in, this, in a kitchen his whole life. He was technically illiterate. He was technically uneducated, um, was certainly never formally recognized by the church in any kind of capacity. Uh, and yet he wrote this very powerful, very short and succinct book that's basically a set of practices about how to practice a mindset that recognizes the presence of God. It's, it's very concise. Um, it's, it's a very, very powerful book. And some of the quotes from it are very moving. And there's one in particular that stood out to me that I wanted to read tonight uh, before we read Psalm 25 that I thought was, uh, was very good. And it, it says this. This author says, he does not, that is God, does not ask much of us, merely a thought of him from time to time, a little act of adoration, sometimes to ask for his grace, sometimes to offer him your sufferings, at other times to thank him for the graces, past and present, he has bestowed on you, in the midst of your troubles, to take solace in him as often as you can. Lift up your heart to him during your meals and in company, the least little remembrance will always be the most pleasing to him. One need not to cry out very loudly, God is nearer to us than we think. And there's a lot of different thoughts about God and certainly different, a lot of different scriptures that come to mind with that thought. But that, you know, that quote basically gets at the gist of what the book is. It it's, uh, talks about the power of small little reminders of God in our life. And so in this guy's case, he was in a kitchen his whole life. So that came while he was washing dishes and cooking food and sweeping floors constantly. Uh, and so I want to, with that in mind, read Psalm 25. Because in Psalm 25, it seems like a very specific psalm that's specific to really just asking God for relief and for forgiveness. But there's very much a mindset of God's presence and God's nature in it. And so just since it's a short psalm, I just want to read it in full here. Psalm 25, starting in verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever, are ever towards the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look upon my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with a cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of their troubles. So that's a psalm that, well, there's a lot to unpack, and we could spend a lot of time unpacking. But in the mindset of practicing the presence of God, there's just a few things I want to notice here, just for some thoughts tonight out of that. One is how David starts the psalm, which is an initial, simple, verbal acknowledgement that he is lifting up his soul to God. It's a simple sort of expression, but it's a reminder to us that in order to remind ourselves of God's presence and of his nature doesn't have to be some kind of grand gesture. 
That's part of the point of prayer. Prayer isn't necessarily some sort of grand gesture. It simply is a verbal acknowledgement that he is there and that we're lifting our souls up to him. But I, what I really want to take a look at is sort of what becomes the theme of this psalm and what David is asking God for in this psalm. And that's in verse 4 and 5. He says, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. And we see that even though David's problem in this psalm is very specific, it, it has to do with, for one, his enemies, and for two, forgiveness of his sins. And yet the solution he finds here is one that isn't just asking God for a specific solution to his immediate problem, even though that is part of what he's asking for. He's asking to understand God's ways in general. And from that, we can see that the method of delivery in anything is actually a reminder of God's overall nature in the first place. And the rest of the psalm here is full of reminders of who God is. And we see that as David focuses on that more and more, it starts with him and God individually and what God has done for him. And then it starts to expand. And by the time you get into verses 8, 9, 10, and 11, uh, it starts to talk about what God's nature is overall, about his paths, about who else he has taught. And suddenly the picture starts to get a lot bigger than just David and just his problems. And by the time you get to verse 15, he says, My eyes are ever towards the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. And so we see that as David, even though he's got a specific problem and he's asking for a specific answer, what he's really doing throughout the psalm is expanding his view by focusing on who exactly God is. And as he focuses on that, we see David's perspective change until he's no longer looking at the problem immediately in front of him. His eyes, we have an image of his vision literally being turned upward towards God here in verse 15. And by the end, verse 21, he does reiterate his troubles, but now it's with a new perspective. And by the time you get to verse 21, it's a statement full of more patience and and willing to wait on God and a desire to keep his character while waiting on God. And so there's much more to unpack from that. And you can pick tons of psalms. The psalms are actually great for all because they're full of all kinds of exercises about focusing on God's presence. But it's worth it as we were reminded in this psalm why it's worth thinking about God's nature and his power and his mercy and actively practicing his presence in a way that sort of, in David's case, it sort of redeems and even resurrects in a way, in a symbolic way, his perspective, even though technically the place he's in hasn't changed. Because you read some psalms where by the end of the psalm, God delivers the psalmist, especially if it's David, from his enemies. In this psalm, nothing about his situation has immediately changed yet. And yet there's a change of perspective, and that becomes the entire point of the psalm, is that it's not, it's not David's immediate situation that has changed, but it is David who has changed. And he's done that by focusing on God and who, what his presence is and the simple reminders of simply what God's nature is. And if that's true for David back then, the same is true for us now. This month we've been talking about the power of Scripture and a bunch of different themes on that. Uh, And we see in some of those studies that the power of Scripture doesn't just lie in the fact that we read it and consistently read it, even though we do need to consistently read it. Scripture's power is seen in how it impacts everything else out as we go forward. And in our simple meditations that we uh, make and that we practice day in and day out, and the part of the power of Scripture is how it helps us recognize and focus and change our perspective in a way that recognizes the presence of God, that consistently practices the presence of God where we are, even if nothing seems to have changed just yet. It still realigns our perspective on ourselves and on others and ultimately on Him. And to realign our perspective on God is to realign our perspective on everything. So there's a lot of ways to come to know His presence, but usually the details of how are sitting directly in front of us. That's the same thing David learns here, and it's the same thing we need to learn now. And so this is the part of our night after our classes that we set aside as an invitation. And so this right now is your invitation. If you find that you need to come to the presence of God and recognize that your need for him in his life, whether you need the help of our church here or you need to come to him in the first place and be baptized, this is your invitation to simply step into an aisle and make your way to the front as we stand.